Welcome to Historic New England's new streaming series, Leading Voices, Conversations on Preservation, Resilience, and Cultural Philanthropy. I'm Vin Cipolla, President and CEO of Historic New England, the nation's oldest and largest regional heritage organization, and a leader in historic preservation and storytelling. Our Leading Voices series hosts cultural and philanthropic leaders from the U.S. and abroad discussing the critical catalytic role of private philanthropy in building, protecting, and ensuring our cultural fabric. Today on Leading Voices, two leaders in philanthropy, Amir Pasek and Linda Johnson, discuss current trends in cultural philanthropy and explore the importance of public and private support to nonprofit organizations that are increasingly multidimensional as they respond to changing community needs. Amir Pasek is the Eugene R. Temple Dean of the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, the world's first school devoted to research and teaching about philanthropy. Prior to joining the school, he worked at the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education at the Johns Hopkins University Paul H. Nitsa School of Advanced International Studies and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Amir also served as a librarian at the Library of Congress. Linda Johnson is the president and CEO of the Brooklyn Public Library, one of the largest library systems in the U.S., which serves 2.6 million residents. Under her leadership, the library has transformed from an analog to a digitally adept institution to ensure that underserved and underrepresented communities have access to knowledge on every platform. Previously, she served as interim president and CEO of the National Constitution Center the CEO of the Free Library of Philadelphia Foundation and president of JCI Data. I'm delighted to welcome Amir Pasek and Linda Johnson to Leading Voices. Thank you so much, Vin, for that lovely introduction. And I'm so pleased to be here with Linda Johnson to continue our Leading Voices conversation. Uh, I'm so pleased that uh, Linda leads the Brooklyn Public Library. One of the proudest moments in my life was when I could use the title librarian for a few years when I looked worked at the Library of Congress. So I'm very much looking forward to learning more about uh, the wonderful library that uh, you lead and also some of the other wonderful leadership roles that you have played in philanthropy, including with the National Constitution Center. So let me kick us off with a little bit of research, given that I come from an academic institution. And one of the pieces of research that we have found is that the number of American households that are giving on a regular basis has been going down over the last 10 years. And when we talk to nonprofits, we hear that many nonprofits are relying on a smaller number of wealthier donors uh, to meet their budget needs and that uh, the participation rates are going down for regular, if you will, everyday donors. Linda, what is your experience in terms of uh, that aspect of philanthropy from where you sit? Um, well, good afternoon, Amir. It's um, nice to finally talk to you. And, um, and thank you for doing this and for inviting me to join you in this series and to thank you to Vin as well. Um, when you said one of your proudest moments was, and I for sure knew you were going to say when you got your first library card, you know, at age four or something like that, because I often hear people uh, talk about that moment um, and they use the word pride to describe how they felt about having a card of their own. Um, in terms of donors, uh, so the library has an interesting uh, conundrum, which is that the wealthier donors who support the library are people who don't rely on it the same way that uh, that less fortunate people uh, or people who are able to give at a lower level uh, use the library. And so we have this kind of parallel track going where we are raising smaller amounts of money from a whole lot of people um, through interesting things that are very traditional, you know, the bake sale at the local branch to raise money for books kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, very sophisticated fundraising programs for capital projects and for complicated initiatives that are really the thing that allows us to be a great library system. The city supports the library to the tune of 85% of our sizable budget. Um, but I say though, that, that, tr that, that tranche from the city keeps the lights on and the doors open, and it's the private philanthropy that allows us to do some of the more innovative and exciting programs. That's fascinating. When, during my short stint at the Library of Congress, J Jim Billington used to say that the Congress paid for for the wine to get into the bottle, but the private philanthropy <laughs> paid for the wine to get them out of the bottle so that the community and, and the rest of the population could, could share. And, and, and I'm going to use that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to quote him on that. 
<laughs> I'm sure he would have been very pleased to hear that. So, <laughs> so we, we are hopefully at the tail end of this historic pandemic. And uh, another piece of research that we have done over the years is looking at you know, how different levels of giving change during recessions. And so we will see what giving was like when the next Giving USA study comes out in a few weeks. It's, it's slated to be released on June 15th to get a sense of what giving was like in 2020. But typically in recessions, what we see is that giving overall tends to go down. Um, and uh, also the, the kind of distribution of giving tends to change a little bit. Giving to basic needs and human services tends to go up and giving to arts and cultural organizations goes, tends to go down. But you know, the big caveat is that all that data is based on patterns since World War II. And we know that we haven't been anything through anything like this for like 100 years. And there's been a wonderful upsurge of, of uh, both formal and informal philanthropy to, to respond to the pandemic. Tell us a little bit about your experience in, in navigating uh, the pandemic and its attendant crises through, um, through the past year or so. Well, certainly giving is off a little bit this year. Um, and partly, of, partly because we don't have some of the same tools at our disposal that we've traditionally relied upon. So, for example, you know, a virtual gala just doesn't bring in quite the same amount of money um, as some lavish gala does. Uh, on the other hand, we don't have the same expense associated with it, so the net number isn't terribly far off, uh, but enough to be painful. Um, and also, in some ways, that virtual gala was kind of great because it was all about teaching people what the library is doing in the communities uh, instead of the program being an excuse to have a fancy party. Um, we fortunately are not only a cultural institution, but also an institution that offers essential services. And so we saw an increase in certain kinds of giving. And I never say something is easy to raise money for because I just don't believe it. So whenever someone says, oh, you'll be able to raise money for this without any problem, I'm always like, yeah. <laughs> I will say that we had a few programs this year that astonished me. And um, the one that's most notable and nearest and dearest to my heart uh, and soul is uh, the issue related in both uh, urban and rural communities of Internet access or the lack of it. Uh, in New York City, you know, over a third of the households don't have adequate broadband at home. Mm -hmm. And so the library was busy figuring out how to transform itself from a you know, sort of traditional institution to a digital institution. It would have happened anyway, but it would have taken four years to do what we did in four months. And as we made all this progress, I mean, and significant strides, so we were having, you know, Tibetan story time with a librarian up in Williamsburg, uh, Brooklyn, that normally would have, you know, maybe been able to accommodate 30 kids and their caregivers, 20,000 people logged on to that. So it wasn't just, you know, Brooklynites that were attending. So that was kind of amazing. But at the same time, and this is really heartbreaking, people who needed those programs the most are the people who didn't have adequate broadband at home. And so we were leaving behind the most vulnerable among us. And so we started to think about what we could do to amplify the message, to kind of hone people's focus on this issue. Um, it's not an issue that we can fix alone. I mean, this is a problem that now, of course, is getting national attention, thank goodness, and I think we're, on, we're finally on the road to, to curing it. But, you know, it's, it's as essential to have Internet access when you're trying to educate your children via Zoom as it is to have water and electricity. And I'm, I'm really not exaggerating. In our, in our society today, I, I believe that. Um, and so we said, well, when we close the libraries, we're going to leave the Wi-Fi signals on because we knew from prior experience, you know, pre-COVID-19, that at night when our libraries were closed, especially nice nights, people came and sat on the steps of our libraries and took advantage of the signal that was seeping out. So we knew they would do that, you know, regardless of time of day. So we left the signals on on all of our libraries. We have 62 branches. And then we said, what else, you know, what else can we do for these neighborhoods? And so we outfitted our traditional bookmobiles. We call them techmobiles now. And we drove them into neighborhoods. And we were able to raise a lot of money to do that pretty quickly. And, uh, and so we were able to drive uh, vehicles into neighborhoods that had low penetration and get signals there. And, and you know, in a, in a city like New York, or in, in Brooklyn in particular, where you have large um, housing, you know, uh, projects, 
you can hit a lot of people with a techno a tech mobile. Um, and then we said, well, what else can we do? And these are all band-aids, but these are things we could do for our patrons now. And we said, mm -hmm. well, if we put antenna on the roofs of our buildings, we can send the signal from that library out 300 feet in every direction. And again, that can hit a lot of people. It's not perfect, but it's, it's, a, it's a difference. And we ra raised money for antenna for 35 branches that were in the most distressed neighborhoods, like within a week's time. Well, that's really remarkable that your institution was able to respond that way and, and bring the kind of that digital um, access to people because, you know, we saw the people who had access to digital means continue to thrive to some extent, but those who did not had a very different experience in terms of the pandemic. So that's quite remarkable. So let's think about, you know, as, as you saw this wonderful importance of technology and, and you've responded to make it more available. And I did see some of those stories about people camping out outside of libraries just to catch the Wi-Fi signal at all, all hours of, of, of the night. So what, what happens to the spaces? You know, we always envision libraries as being these great community spaces uh, where people gather, where they learn a community um, gathering place. How do you see the, the importance of spaces? What will become of the spaces as maybe some of the, the digital habits we have stick with us as, as we exit the pandemic? So um, we always have referred to um, libraries as kind of the town square of every community. And we were talking about it, in, especially in cities, in, in more literal terms. Um, I'm sorry, more figurative terms than literal. But uh, last summer, this strange phenomenon happened, like overnight. But after the George Floyd killing and the protests that were um, organized in Brooklyn and Manhattan and elsewhere in New York City, people started to gather before and after these um, protests. And in the case of Brooklyn, they were gathering on the steps of the Central Library, which is uh, on Grand Army Plaza. Uh, it sits on Prospect Park, so it's a, it's a central location with uh, good public transportation. And, you know, people, the, that was the summer. People had been isolated really since March, and they all of a sudden came out, you know, of their homes. And all of a sudden, social distancing, like, you know, was like a distant memory. <laughs> And they were coming into this space to talk to their neighbors, to share ideas, to commiserate with one another, um, and to socialize just like you would in a town square. And I was like, wow, like this is literally the town square right now. And, they, and, and they, this happened day after day uh, last summer. And so I, I think it, it kind of reaffirmed the role that our physical spaces uh, play in our neighborhoods, and I really don't see that changing. Um, I think that there are certainly people who have been and will continue to use the library without ever stepping through our doors, and I, I think that number will grow. But I also think that in terms of the role we play in communities, that that will continue to thrive as well. People are waiting to get in to use the computers um, and, and to browse the collections and to actually reconnect with the librarians. Our librarians have strong connections in their communities. And, and so I, I think for a section of our you know, audience um, that the physical space will be as important, if not more than ever. Well, that's wonderful to hear, you know, thinking about our public space anchored by libraries and what happens around the spaces of libraries is so much more encouraging than thinking about our public space being anchored at social media and those kinds of uh, online, online yeah, platforms. Yeah, so true. With your face down and your phone, you know, you don't yeah. even know what's going on around you. Yeah, you know, one of the initiatives that we've launched just in the last couple of weeks is, um, is uh, uh, BPL Outdoors. And uh, I, just, <laughs> I just signed a requisition for 5,000 pounds of outdoor furniture and in partnership with the Department of Transportation, we are creating outdoor reading rooms in front of uh, a bunch of our branches so that this summer we can lend laptops, they can take advantage of this outdoor Wi-Fi that we have and, and people can use the, you know, the library in greater numbers uh, than they'd be able to if we were limited to the indoor space. That's wonderful to hear, that's great. You know, and, and you know, being able to access books I think would have made Thomas Jefferson proud who said I cannot live without books and that's boldly displayed in the in the in the uh, Library of Congress but you know one of the other pieces of, of philanthropy that is changing is ge generational attitude so you know some of the research that we do show that you know millennial and younger generations have a different attitude uh, toward 
their civic engagement. They don't uh, kind of write the checks and volunteer with formal uh, 501c3 organizations. They're much more interested in what can happen online with advocacy, with um, not formal institutions. They're somewhat out of favor. And of course, the way information is, is consumed is different, you know, not, not so much physical books and a lot more digital work. How are you responding both in terms of philanthropy and in terms of programs kind of to the changing patterns in terms of generational, different generations' habits? Yeah, I think for us, the biggest challenge uh, in the year ahead will be trying to figure out how to continue to maintain what I'll call our traditional services um, while maintaining the digital, uh, uh, really the, the database and trove of digital material that we developed uh, you know, during the pandemic. And, you know, it's like we can't go back to the way we were. The trick will be um, figuring out how, how to fund both businesses simultaneously without depriving either, uh, you know, either audience um, of what they come to the library to take advantage of. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting balancing act, uh, uh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a good problem to have. You know, um, we've got people who uh, value deeply what we've done traditionally, and now we have all these people who are kind of urging us to be, uh, you know, our best selves moving forward. It's, it's, yeah. it's been positive. It's been exhausting, but it's been positive. Yes, exhausting is, is a theme for the pandemic here, I would think. But you mentioned also people gathering on your steps uh, before and after kind of some of the, some of the uh, protests re regarding the racial reckoning. And even before the killing of George Floyd, you know, I was aware of some of the controversies in arts circles uh, and board, and specifically around board dynamics and kind of the, our habit of putting kind of very well connected, very well, well wealthy people on the boards of our arts organizations, because that was a kind of a standard way to cultivate some of your major donors. And yet um, many people started to criticize that in the sense that it was you know, not reflective the, the our sense of the the inequities in our society, and that that the uh, the boards are not as representative of the communities that we're trying to serve. And and I think we're all becoming much more conscious of equities and some of the power dynamics that are inherent in, in philanthropy when we expect you know wealthy people to to come and support us and kind of some of the the power that's ceded to them. Is that affected your work at all in terms of some of the kind of the equity concerns and, and how, they're, how they might be impacting kind of your own institutional dynamics? Yeah. So we certainly have equity concerns, and I'll get to them in a minute. I will say, I'll toot my own horn here, um, that we had started to focus on this issue of the board adequately representing the communities we serve before the surge in um, Black Lives Matter. And, uh, you know, partly because we're in a borough that is so diverse, um, probably one of the most diverse sets of, of communities in the country. And, uh, you know, we, we provide services in over 30 languages because that's what's demanded. And we have foreign language material and English as second language. And we have civic engagement classes for people who are taking citizenship tests and, um, you know, on and on, uh, because that's the way for us to be responsive to our communities. And so we took a look and we said, well, in addition to being able to support the work of the library, the board also needs to reflect the communities that we serve. And so we had, we had started to make a push um, for quite a while ago. And so the board is, uh, uh, as far as New York City boards go, really pretty diverse, a really pretty interesting group of people. We we have pockets uh, where we need to do better, but um, but all in all, you know, not terrible. Um, I think that it is very interesting to see how quickly a lot of boards uh, have turned on a dime uh, and started to uh, put in higher priority issues of diversity. It, you know, it was always like first, how much could your board member give? Um, how committed were they? What other institutions were they supporting? Was this institution going to be among the top priorities of the particular philanthropist? And now, you know, I'm not hearing that song so much. Um, I'm hearing people, you know, asking like, who, who can we get for the board, you know, who would, you know, help us on, on diversity? It's probably long overdue, but it's painful because, uh, you know, at the same time, everybody's trying to figure out how to support all the work that they're doing and they need uh, they need private dollars to do that. So it's it's a complicated issue, and um, and it certainly uh, exists for just about every cultural institution that I can think of. 
Now, in terms of the library and equity, you know, we had a big reckoning over the summer um, and spent a lot of time listening to our staff and our employees about racism that they had experienced in the branches. We just had the second of two two-hour uh, DEI training sessions for our board. Um, I think our board does pretty well, but I think it was important because staff is going through the training and pretty important for the board to kind of understand what's happening uh, and to be uh, acting in solidarity with our staff. That's, that's fascinating. And obviously the diversity of your community um, uh, plays a role in, in, in where you're situated and how you look at these things. Yeah, we have, uh, we have a institute on the Mays Family Institute on Diverse Philanthropy that does research on donors of color and donors from underrepresented communities to also work against the presumption that, that you know, all donors are uh, kind of white, mostly male, and, and that there was a, a large diversity and a, a very deep history of philanthropy in, in, in all communities that represent the diversity of our of our country at the same time. And I'll just mention that, you know, I taught a course uh, last fall on philanthropy in times of crisis and our students, you know, the issues of board dynamics and this trade off that you brought up is something that's really animating a lot of the people who are coming into the field and trying to balance yeah. that realizing you, you, no, you need the, the resources. I should, yeah. I mean, I should add because it's, it's, you know, couldn't be truer. Um, there are different ways to contribute to the institution. And so Brooklyn is um, a community of writers for sure. Uh, like, you know, the, the whole, you know, all the journalists from the New York Times live in Brooklyn and I'm hardly exaggerating. <laughs> and some yeah. of them are on our board and they're extremely helpful to us. You know, they moderate programs or they're guests, you know, on panels. And so, you know, everybody contributes kind of in their own way. And, and so we've got some pretty fantastic writers on our board, which as a library, of course, uh, is important. That's right. Time, talent, testimony, and treasure, all of those things are <laughs> part it. of the ways you can do it. So, yeah. you know, speaking of which, you know, you've, 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 you've led, you lead the uh, Brooklyn Public Library that gets significant government support. And then I think the National Constitution Center also received significant government funding. Can, so, so what is your sense of the evolution, either kind of how it's moving or how it should move in terms of that balance between kind of government support and philanthropic support of of some of these institutions. Right, well, just um, so in terms of the National Constitution Center, the government was extremely generous in getting, getting that, uh, that building built. Uh, it's on Independence Mall in Philadelphia, and it was an act of Congress that, um, that got us uh, the considerable amount of money to build a building designed by Pay Cobb Freed, you know, I am Pay's firm. Uh, but then they said, you're on your own. <laughs> so um, so there was a lot of philanthropy going on there uh, as well. Um, and there's really hardly an institution that, um, that gets by just with, with, just with public funding. Um, so uh, the library is the same thing. As I said, you know, the lights on, the doors open. Uh, but we really have, um, during my tenure anyway in Brooklyn, have really stepped up the private giving uh, to make sure that we can be as innovative as as possible. I mean, because there's really no limit to what we can do for our patrons if we're um, creative and funded well. Um, and the site would say the same for the National Constitution Center. You know, it's uh, it's got a great location on Independence Mall, but it's got a challenge because the a lot of the other sites on the mall are free. You know, you can go to the Liberty Bell for free, but you've got to pay admission um, at the Constitution Center. And so, you know, um, everybody's got a little bit that they've got to, uh, to overcome. Right. So let me ask you a, a final question about uh, kind of leadership and philanthropy. I mean, raising funds to support uh, the institution that you lead is clearly vital to, the, to its survival and its thriving and its innovation. You know, how do you how do you organize your, your thinking, your time, your resources in order to kind of maximize uh, the return on, on the investment of your time in terms of uh, fundraising? Kind of what tips would you have to for leaders of, of museums and libraries around the country who, who may be struggling and, and wondering, you know, how do I replicate some of that success? Yeah. So, you know, I think partly it depends on what's going on. You know, if you've got a capital campaign going on, obviously that um, adds another layer or another demand, set of demands on your time uh, for fundraising, uh, which we do, of course, who doesn't? Um, we have a four-phase program going on for our central library. We just uh, finished, we completed 
and opened last week, phase one, which is beautiful and wildly successful, but you know we're already thinking about phase three because phase two is funded and in design. Uh, but you know we got to get three and four done also. There's you know it's it's endless. <laughs> um, yeah. So and then there's uh, also, of course, the pandemic, which put tremendous um, uh, demands on my time. You know, just the operation of the library during this last year has definitely required more of my time. But on the other hand, because we were isolating, uh, I didn't have the same kind of travel or the same time uh, spent with donors. You know, uh, I wasn't going to lunch with a donor. And so even if I was on the phone with a donor, I saved the travel time. And I think uh, I can say for myself and, and really for uh, my counterparts at other institutions, you know, we really haven't worked harder. You know, you get on the phone at eight in the morning and you're, you're getting up at eight at night <laughs> some days and you might be bleary eyed, bleary eyed, but you did in one day what, you know, you would never have been able to do during right. normal times. Now, I am not suggesting we want to do this you know, forever, <laughs> but, you know, it it certainly allowed us to push forward during a moment. Um, and, you know, I would normally say that, you know, pre pandemic, uh, you know, I probably spent 50 percent of my time on uh, either fundraising or, um, you know, shepherding relationships um, and and handling programs that are you know terrific intellectually but also designed to uh, you know uh, encourage philanthropy and so I would say you know as a rule of thumb uh, for me in my institution given how much money I get from the city uh, probably about 50 50 in terms of time now having said that because I have one donor that gives 85 percent of the budget I have a large government affairs team that does an amazing job with City Hall and 16 council people in Brooklyn and state assemblymen and the, you know, the, the myriad of people that come uh, with that whole operation. Um, and so, you know, I end up, when I say 50% of my time, some of that is, you know, in City Hall, like testifying like this time of year because the budget, uh, the budget uh, will be um, issued by June 30th by law. So this is a heavy time for budget negotiations and testimony. Uh, Albany, because you know I can see all the assembly people in one location uh, if I go to Albany. Uh, and so there is uh, there's some there are public aspects to that time as well. Okay. Do you, do you envision that you'll be spending more time on video calls even after the pandemic? Because there is an efficiency built into it, right? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I, what I imagine is there'll be less travel, you know, because the need to travel to see somebody, uh, you know, for an hour, um, you know, that, that's an extreme, but you don't need to do that anymore. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's been, it, I, I've really enjoyed learning more about the, the library and its, its uh, responses to our current challenges. Is there anything else that we should, we should, we should touch upon before we, uh, we depart? Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, you know, conscious of your audience, uh, and uh, I will say that one of the great accomplishments during the pandemic for Brooklyn Public Library was uh, merging with the Brooklyn Historical Society and merging our collections. We had a Brooklyn collection in the public library. It was the, our only special collection. Otherwise, we're purely a public library. Um, and the Brooklyn Historical Society had a, an extraordinary collection and an amazing building, which is landmarked and a library within the building that's beautiful in Brooklyn Heights. And so we put the collections together. We put the teams together. We had great outreach librarians, but they have you know, professionally trained archivists. We had material, but the Historical Society had all of the environmental conditions that are required to collect at the level um, that we weren't able to collect before because we couldn't adequately take care of the material. And, um, and so we're very excited about this because um, we had this notion that um, the, their, the interest in our history uh, has never been greater, um, especially as we're talking about things like resistance and the uh, abolitionist movement. Um, and, you know, there is this moment in time where we can democratize access to all of that material. The library essentially democratizes access to the world's knowledge. 
Um, so we've now, we will eliminate any kind of entry fee to the um, Historical Society. We've, we've caught, we're calling the center the Center for Brooklyn History. And uh, we're having an exhibition on Juneteenth. It'll launch on Juneteenth, which will be largely outdoors, but also digital, that focuses on anti-racist uh, uh, act activity in Brooklyn uh, over time, so different eras. Um, specifically on uh, racism against African Americans, and uh, and so we're beginning this process of encouraging not just people uh, in the neighborhood to visit the historical society, not just scholars who came from far and wide to take advantage of it, but really to make everybody in Brooklyn understand that there's something there for them, and perhaps most importantly, and this is part of the um, Brooklyn Resists exhibition, to encourage people to contribute uh, their own ephemera to the Historical Society, or now the Center for Brooklyn History, so that we can be building a collection for future users uh, so that they can, when they look back you know, at the George Floyd moment, um, look at all of the street photography that we've taken and the you know, documents that we've collected um, and understand deeply how it's impacted their lives. That's fascinating, kind of that community orientation um, that's that's becoming part of the norm. I think that's fascinating, bringing the historical society and, and having it more community engaged. So to that end, let me conclude with a uh, with a book recommendation for uh, uh, for for you and perhaps the audience, but written by one of our faculty members that is receiving a lot of awards called "The Gospel of Giving," which is based on the life of Madame C.J. Walker, who was a contemporary of Rockefeller and and the Carnegies, who built so many uh, libraries around our country. Uh, but Madame C.J. Walker was the first self-made woman millionaire. She happened to be African-American and made her fortune uh, during the Jim Crow South and also supported a lot of activist causes and actually moved to New York at one point in her career as well. But, but the book also is more than an uh, of a biography. It also traces, uh, puts in contest the, imp the importance of uh, black women-led mutual aid societies and social enterprises in kind of sustaining um, uh, black communities throughout our history. So... I just thought I would mention that in the spirit of your connection between books and historical Wow, society. you know, I haven't read that book. Uh, thank you, Amir. I'm going to put it on the top of my pile. Thanks so much. That's great. Wonderful. Well, Linda, it's been such a pleasure to, to uh, get to know you a little bit. And uh, it was, it was uh, lovely to be part of these Leading Voices, this part of this Leading Voices series. And, and I look, look forward to uh, another dialogue in the future. Great. Thank you, Amir. Amir and Linda, thanks for giving us a deeper sense of the current philanthropic climate for nonprofits and the critical importance of public and private support for cultural institutions. To find out more about our guests today, as well as about leading voices in historic New England's heritage work, please visit historicnewengland.org slash leading voices. On behalf of Historic New England, I'm Vince Cipolla. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>